Is he right to connect those dots? There's no question that the failure to provide aid, which is now a five-month failure, this should have been approved when proposed in September, has led Ukraine to deal with a shortage of ammunition. And I think it's highly likely that if Ukraine had been armed properly, if that aid package had been approved several months ago, mm -hmm. they would have had more than enough ammunition to hold Avdiivka. Well, it, it raises the question for me, Ambassador, that when, as President Biden has done on multiple occasions, he has said the U.S. will be there for Ukraine for as long as this conflict goes on, a promise that he may not necessarily be able to keep because it relies on Congress also keeping that progress. Should the U.S. have prepared Ukraine more for the possible scenario that aid would stop? Well, would, they, would Ukraine be conducting itself differently? I think that there's a... This is not a reason to criticize the administration. But the administration has made two very serious mistakes that have contributed to the situation. The first is that they should have made the aid package proposal not in September of last year, but in March or April. Hmm. And I know that there were especially many Republicans in Congress who were wondering why the administration dawdled. And the second mistake has been a characteristic of the administration's since even before the Russian big invasion, which is the administration has been timid and slow in providing Ukraine the weapons to produce a more effective impact on the battlefield. The limits of Ukraine's gains on land with the counteroffensive is a direct result of the administration's refusal to provide F-16s, the longer range attackums, which they even to this day have yet to provide, although they're now talking about it, Abrams tanks and quantities and other other measures. And this is because the administration has been partly intimidated by Moscow's nuclear threats, which is not good politics, not good geopolitics. Ambassador, our viewers and listeners expected the fall of Avdivka because Melinda Herring told us this would happen. The senior fellow at the Atlantic Council joined us last week and shared her concern over what was happening there. Here's what she said. The city that everyone's watching that's in ruins that the Russians are likely to take by the end of the month is Adivka. And, and that will be one more city uh, in eastern Ukraine that, where there's absolutely nothing left. Uh, but then the line will, 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 will continue to, to uh, ebb away. Ambassador, you were just cataloging some of the mistakes that you see in your view that this administration has been made. Help us prevent the next one. What can Joe Biden do to move the needle on Ukrainian funding? Uh this is, this is a hard one, and you can't blame this on the administration. Uh, this is a problem produced by a small faction within the Republican Congress who don't understand that America has a critical interest in stopping Putin in Ukraine, that Putin is our foe. He's identified us as Russia's main adversary, and they are doing everything they can to undermine American interests. And the place to make Putin pay for this is in Ukraine because Ukraine is fighting for its existence as an independent nation. And all we need to do is arm and uh, Ukraine properly and provide them economic assistance. And the aid which we are providing Ukraine represents approximately 4% of our defense budget. And with this, the Ukrainians have been able to stop the Russians. So uh, if the Republicans who are holding this up let the aid package pass. One, there'll be no for, further defeats for Ukraine on land. And two, if then the Biden administration sends them more advanced weapons, we'll see Ukraine begin to take back more of this country and kick the Russians out, which is very much in our interests. Well, Ambassador, you speak of a few Republicans who are more opposed to the notion of continuing to provide support to Ukraine. You could argue that that comes from the very top of the Republican Party right now, the man who very likely will be the Republican nominee, the former president, Donald Trump. And of course, he just in recent weeks have suggested that if NATO countries do not pay enough, he would encourage Russia to do whatever the hell it wants with them. You are joining us from Poland. I know you were in Munich as well at the security conference in recent days. How much concern do you sense on the part of our European allies about the prospect of another Trump administration? Well, there is great concern, first and foremost, about the state package, but secondly, about the possibility that if Trump wins, 
uh, American support for NATO may diminish substantially, and American support for Ukraine may also diminish substantially. Uh, I understand those concerns. I don't know if they reflect what would happen in a second Trump administration. There's no question that the statement Trump made about NATO was not responsible, that it undermines our interests. It's also true he said similar things as a candidate in 2015 and 16 and as president of the United States. But it's also true that his administration, uh, despite those statements, despite the way Trump behaved with Putin at the 2018 Helsinki summit, took some strong measures against Russia that the Obama administration refused to take, like sending javelins, anti-tank weapons. Uh, so it's possible that a second Trump administration might include some irresponsible statements without the policy going in the wrong direction. I'm not predicting that's the outcome, but I see that as one of, one of two possibilities. Ambassador, uh, you also served as Consul General in Jerusalem in your long career in the U.S. Foreign Service. And I have to ask you while you're with us about what's happening there is the United States has drafted a ceasefire resolution that goes before the U.N. Security Council. Should it pass? Uh, we will see. What, what we're seeing right now is a very common phenomenon in the Middle East. Things like that happened uh, when I was working on the Middle East, both from Tel Aviv and from Jerusalem, mm -hmm. uh, back in the 60s before I, before I joined. Um, Israel is understandably responding to the savage attack that Hamas launched. And we've seen things like this in the past. Um, then the Arab world you know, up gets angry, and they push for Israel to stop. And the United States, while supporting Israel, feels that pressure. And then we counsel restraint on Israel. Sometimes Israel listens, sometimes it doesn't. And even as we counsel restraint, we protect Israel in the in the UN, and we did that recently with the uh, proposal by Algeria for a ceasefire resolution, which failed as we opposed it. Uh, but then eventually some sort of understanding is reached between Washington and, and Jerusalem, and uh, Israel exercises some restraint. But so the US resolution is obviously something we support, something which Israel is still bridling against. Um, but if we push hard, there's a good chance that Israel will go along and that the Arabs will also go along. But this is a work in progress and there are other possibilities.